Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to People's Health Dispatch. Uh, today, we are joined by Chi Han from Third World Network, and he's also the co convener of People's Health Forum Malaysia. Uh, Chi Han is here with us today to speak on the issues of health and healthcare that are being faced in Malaysia and give us a description of what is really happening there. Uh, welcome, Chi Han. Thank you, Gagaya, and thanks, uh, People's Health Dispatch. For the invite. I'm happy to share with you about the situation in Malaysia. Whenever we talk these days, uh, we are uh, you know, starting with the issues of COVID. And I think maybe let me start there. What is the you know, present situation of uh, pandemic there? And how was the response in the last two years uh, towards you know, the COVID pandemic in Malaysia? And is there something that you want to say about this? Yeah, I think the currently the government is doing a good job, uh, especially after they ensure that the vaccine supply is sufficient to give the, uh, pop, the overall population and even the booster doses. So uh, at least half of the po population has at least have been given uh, second uh, the first uh, booster dose. So that means uh, and also for the first two dose. Uh, we have uh, more than 80% of our coverage. So for um, vaccination campaign, immunization campaign, is, it can be said it's a huge success. And actually, this is the foundation for a successful control of the pandemic uh, and transition to the, uh, the endemic currently. Um, but uh, for the past two years, uh, lessons have been learned, especially when the time um, uh, before we received uh, any vaccination, I remember the Delta uh, virus strain actually devastated our public health care system and caused a lot of uh, deaths and hospitalization. And many actually have to even wait around in the hospital compounds, even have to sleep outside the camp, uh, the temporary camp set up by the government just to accommodate the large amount of uh, 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 infected. Uh, patients at that time. So uh, this means that there are definitely some deficiencies in the uh, public health system there. I, I think uh, Malaysia is one of those countries with a mixed system where you have both the public as well as private. Could you speak a bit about, you know, the public health system there? How is it one, you know, how, how, uh, how does it function? But also, you know, how strong or how weak it is because I think in your recent report, you have detailed uh, a lot of things on the issues faced by public health systems in Malaysia. And how is the response of the government to these demands too? Thanks for the question. Yes, um, Malaysia has gained uh, independence from uh, the British in 1957. And we actually inherited um, some kind of a structure and system from the UK, especially when the NHS uh, getting popularized in UK and um, there's some spirit and some um, uh, fundamental uh, values uh, infused here in Malaysia. So um, so in Malaysia we have we, we, is, there's a two-tier healthcare system. Of course a government uh, become the main uh, provider service uh, health service provider and also uh, the single payer for the public health system. That works uh, similarly as uh, the UK, uh, at least uh, before, or at least uh, before. Uh, I mean, uh, the the contemporary uh, uh, UK. Yeah. Um, so we do have a sizable um, private sector here, but they function mainly on the market system. So um, besides the standards of uh, operation. And the infrastructures are being regulated. Um, other than that, uh, even health data, even the pricing of the services are all determined by the market. And um, uh, there's not too much of a crosstalk between the public and health, uh, private uh, health system. And that's actually created some kind of a tension especially with the limited um, healthcare resources, especially the manpower, especially the, uh, the um, 
uh, health practitioners, the, the, the labor for, for that. Yeah, um, but all in all, I, I would say um, our Malaysian healthcare, public healthcare system or the structure is uh, pretty much intact. We do, we have three le levels. The first level is the primary care and then the secondary care and tertiary. Tertiary being the government hospitals and the primary care, we do have a, a lot of um, uh, health clinics run by the government. It will have a rural clinics. So um, the statistic uh, told us that 92.6% of population live within five kilometer radians of a public health center. So it's a quite an achievement if you look at the uh, Malaysia uh, uh, geography um, um, distribution there, you will know that there's a vast land in the East Malaysia. Um, and with that kind of record, 92.6 is uh, actually kind of achievement for the government, but it's not easy. There's still a lot of uh, problems. And uh, we do have a very good uh, primary care in terms of uh, immunization. Um, there's something that we learned from uh, the British time. Um, we do have, we do boost about 98.4 to 98.5 of um, uh, infants born in 2018 administered with BCG, uh, diphtheria, toxin, polio immunization. This is considered very high, especially when um, even before pandemic, there's a, already a lot of um, uh, vaccine skeptic or, or anti-vaxxer kind of campaign. In Malaysia, still in 2018, we have this 98.4.5% like of the coverage is considered very good. And the government did spend on health uh, totally from the taxpayers' money, I mean, from general taxation. We spend about 1,123 per capita. It's equivalent to um, 260 USD per person per year. And, uh, but uh, one big problem for Malaysia is that the, the, the society and the population are not actually uh, really healthy. The, the health trend is actually going down. There's all a reason, uh, especially when you look at the, the major indicator such as uh, uh, overweight a population. This comes close to half, one in two are considered overweight. Uh, I would say probably including myself <laughs> that I need to take care of. Yeah, and then one in five uh, having diabetes and uh, about a, a third of the um, population uh, they don't do regular exercise. And so you can see there's a lot of health problem and the, the, the trends are actually getting worse. So um, if a government cannot control at the, the primary care level, that's what uh, the People's Health Forum uh, reform is about. We want to strengthen the primary care. Uh, there, there's a lot of uh, uh, um, linkages problem especially when you're talking about um, continuity of care or health promotion, there's a, a serious lack of uh, uh, effort uh, on the ground, especially utilizing uh, the private sector resources. Because at the primary care, more than eight, about 80% of the GPs are actually uh, belong to the private sector. So, it's a, it's a kind of a resource threat for the public sector to handle. There's a lot of demand for the primary, the primary care. So they couldn't deliver because also they lack of budget to, to work with the private sector to take care of the, uh, the, the, the population health at the primary care level. So uh, the statistic told us that uh, there's uh, 2.8 million of a hospital admission in the government hospital alone, have bear in mind that uh, Malaysia has, has only 33 million of people. So it's about close to 10% of a hospital admission per year. And 48 million of um, uh, outpatient uh, uh, attendance in the government clinics. 48, that means uh, that's a lot. <laughs> So there's a lot of demand and these demands uh, keep on piling on the government and yet 
the government uh, budget does not really increase fast enough to keep up with the demands. So basically this speak volume about uh, the, the Malaysian healthcare problem and challenges right now. Because uh, uh, private sector do have uh, more hospital than uh, the public one. They have 202 uh, private hospitals and government only has 156 in 2020. But in terms of the admission, it's about 70% uh, uh, government has to take care of. In terms of uh, outpatient, it's close to 90%. So all the burdens are with the government. It's, uh, it's kind of expected because in Malaysia, uh, we provide the care as, as one of the like, social welfare services as with uh, education is for free or at a nominal sum. Uh, because uh, this is a fundamental right to the uh, and the services welfare services for the population, so we still retain that. Unlike Singapore, they have already uh, metaphor for us to another system where people always have to pay. There's nothing for free in Singapore, although they also gain dependence from uh, British. They don't do the same. So in Malaysia, we are proud to say we still maintain the very cheap system where you only need to pay one ringgit to see a doctor. Uh, this affair uh, um, is uh, with us since 1980s. So for uh, close to 40 years, the rate doesn't change. One ringgit to see a doctor, five ringgit to see a specialist. You can't find it anywhere. Uh, so it's close to, to, close to free uh, of, of charge. But um, there's a lot of challenges because um, the private sector is uh, thriving um, before the pandemic. One thing they are thriving on is the medical tourism. It's a selling of the health services uh, because uh, they deem the, the Malaysian market small enough, but they uh, can attract, uh, they, have, they are in good proposition to attract a lot of uh, Western and rich uh, Gulf uh, Arab countries people to come to Malaysia to use the health service. And we, we uh, Malaysia boosts our uh, health uh, care standard and quality on par with Singapore and any top uh, Western countries. Yeah, so um, that actually caused a lot of strength because when you need to op operate a, a private hospital with specialists, then you have to get it from somewhere. Um, the, the usual, uh, place for the private sector to push the uh, specialists uh, from the uh, public sector or even within different uh, private hospitals. So with the kind of growth in the uh, medical tourism and the private uh, uh, healthcare sector, you can see that actually more and more government uh, resources drain. And that's why you see there's a lot more private hospital. Uh, Chihen, than, before we go into a bit of the private health sector, I would like to uh, you know, ask you more about that in a while. Okay, but sure, You've sure. been saying how important the you know, public health system is because you're saying there is this huge demand, the budget you know, does not always meet the demand, the infrastructure is, I mean, we have seen in the pandemic and all through that, yep. the resources are tight and uh, there's always beds are low, the number of doctors are low and yep. nurses and so on. So, and, you know, globally, we see there is an onslaught on this understanding of provision, we, call, I mean, we say public provision of healthcare. So, is there any such thing and is there any, I mean, what is it that civil society or organizations and activists in Malaysia, uh, you know, what is it that you, you have been demanding the government for one improvement of the existing public health infrastructure? Uh, and two, from, you know, privatizing or from, you know, because we see in many countries, hospitals are slowly decreased or they are privatized and so on. So are there such issues in Malaysia? And if so, how is it that, you know, are there any discussion with the government and debate and so on? Yeah, um, so very good question, but it's a difficult one for the government. Uh, government treats the um, health sector as uh, economic sector. That's the first uh, problem that we, we, we face. Uh, once they have this uh, 
policy proposition, that means they would actually would not do much to actually stop the sector from growing. Then the, the problem just exacerbate. Uh, but we want to actually, uh, from the civil society, often we want to government to rectify the problem, actually to strengthen the public uh, sector by uh, investing more. Because uh, currently, uh, uh, the public spending on the public health is uh, very inadequate in Malaysia. In uh, 2018, before the pandemic, uh, Malaysia only spent 3.8% uh, of GDP on health. That includes uh, the private uh, spending, but it's, uh, it's actually below the world's average 6.6. .6. It's not because we are healthier, just that um, there's a reason for that. Then we, if you look at another um, uh, indicator, is the public's uh, uh, government expenditure on health. Uh, uh, in the total of um, government expenditure, Malaysia only spend 8.5% of the government total government budget on health. If you look at the world's uh, world, uh, average is six, uh, 10 .4, but if you compare with the similar economic, uh, social economic, uh, development country, the upper middle country such as South Africa and Thailand, you will see that they spend 13.3% and 15% on health. Obviously, Malaysia does not spend enough on health. And this actually uh, is the source of a problem because if you say we do, do not build enough of the clinics and the hospital, then you need money. If we don't recruit enough of specialists or don't trade enough, you also need money. And if you think about the private, uh, uh, the, the primary care uh, that we do not have enough service to really take care of uh, every uh, citizen, that also needs money to run. For example, you can also uh, have a program to outsource it to the private to join the, the program. Since you know we have a uh, seventy to eighty percent of uh, of GPs are in the private sector, so that's what how I I look at the problem. Yeah, if a government thinks that um, health sector is for money making, then there will be inconsistency. Yeah, I think this clash of looking at it as a right and looking at it as a market commodity is always uh, the clash, and a, a lot more in the health sector. So, I, I from there, I'll you know I'll use this into uh, looking at you know you are also saying in addition to the public sector, there is a vast uh, private health, uh, health sector there. Both in the COVID pandemic and in general, what is the analysis of this private sector? Uh, is it actually able to cater to the needs of the people? And it, first of all, is it accessible? Because you know, in many countries, we see the private sector is a lot more costly, and people have to spend a lot from their pocket to an extent of you know even selling their assets and so on. So. Uh, there is this always a conflict with private sector for many of us, uh, you know, even I find it a bit difficult. So yeah, how do you see uh, the private sector, uh, Chiha? And what is your analysis or criti critical comments on it? Yeah, thanks for the question. I think uh, just now there's one additional point I forgot to mention is that our civil society actually demand the government to spend uh, Close, uh, at least 4% of GDP on public health. Yeah, it's not just combined with a uh, private uh, expenditure, you reach the 4%. Public expenditure alone has to be 4% and above. And that's what the, the former government, when they took power, uh, 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 defeating the long-standing government before that, and they actually promised 4% in five years, but uh, within two years of their governance, they fail. They, 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 uh, yeah. The, there's, there's a the collapse of the government. So they couldn't fulfill, and uh, we didn't see that they have the political view to fulfill the, the promise. And now Malaysia is coming uh, to the general election time period again, and this time the three main uh, political coalition promise they try to outbid each other. They say five percent in five years. <laughs> So uh, the all three big one, they promise five percent. So actually, I hope, and uh, we, from the civil society, we definitely will push the government to actually realize that because it's actually a, 
quite a, a, a steep increase in terms of uh, the real money term. Uh, if they really commit to um, getting 5% of GDP in five years, that means uh, every year they have to increase at least 10 billion ringgit Malaysia for the health budget. <laughs> so it's not a small feat. But anyway, uh, um, so what the pandemic told us is that we they exposed the public healthcare system in terms of infrastructure. Like I say just now in the beginning, there's a lot of um, demand for beds uh, because uh, people are sick and it's because due to COVID, you need special kind of uh, environment to keep, to contain the virus. So actually that time, simply the public uh, hospital couldn't cope with that many of a search of uh, demand for the beds. And even at that time, the private hospitals were not cooperative. They were into a negotiation with the government talking about money terms. They refused to take uh, COVID patients. Uh, they just want non-COVID. So they asked the government to decay the non-COVID patients to, uh, the, to their hospital, but don't want anything to do with the COVID because that will actually um, uh, scare off uh, other uh, uh, local patients uh, because uh, if they would have a COVID section, then people will be afraid to go. This one reason. And then the maintenance of a COVID uh, um, uh, hospital uh, condition is also quite strict and costly. So from that, you, you know the system is not working. When we have two tier system and not cross talk and the private sector only think about their profit, their, their reputation and public opinion about them, then uh, they're not, they don't put people's health as a priority and don't think about people's benefit. So that's what we always uh, wear when uh, negotiating with the private sector. And uh, that's, uh, in the last year, uh, government even uh, declared uh, public emergency in Malaysia, partly due to political reason, but also they use a uh, pandemic as a, as a reason. I won't say excuse, but it's a legitimate reason to force the hospital, private hospital to, to, to cooperate, to, to accept uh, COVID patients. That was the moment that they started to actually admit COVID patients. So you even have to use the emergency law to force them. Uh, so, uh, so if the gulf as now now we are into the endemic uh, period, and the private hospital currently um, trying to going back to the the normal days, and they the door is open already for the medical tourists. Uh, and in the latest uh, government budget, also they they allocate budget for the development of this sector. So I would expect uh, this problem will go on, and uh, because uh, to to your uh, for your for understanding, uh, the specialists in Malaysia are usually trained by the public sector. Private sector never spend a cent on training specialists. And when they poach, there's nothing like a, like a football market. You need to pay a transfer fee or something. There's nothing like that. So they just poach <laughs> uh, and people can just resign. And actually, there's a 50% of um, uh, retrition uh, rate. What do you call? Attrition rate. Attrition rate. Yeah. Okay, sorry. There's a 50% of attrition rate uh, from the government, especially. That's among the, the age 30 to 39. 50% uh, with a pre average three years of a post specialization experience, they just choose to leave. Going where? Or oh, one, one, they could go to Singapore or other or overseas country, but mostly they just cross over to the private. So it's like the government doing something for the profit of the private sector. This is not right. So um, I, I'm, I'm happy to see that in one of the uh, major political coalition in their manifesto in the gen generation current period now, they say they ask, they will want the private sector to train their own uh, specialists. I think it's a good proposal. At least they should be responsible for what they want to uh, groom uh, for their own uh, specialists, not to push from the pub public sector anymore. Uh, so you know, you're telling uh, 
of course, taking away uh, the trained doctors, these all are some of the issues we have been facing uh, in other countries also. But what about the patients? How is there this thing? I mean, you know, you are saying that initially they were not admitting uh, patients properly and so on. Uh, have there been any uh, issues of overcharging of patients and, you know, uh, patients going to courts and something like that? Yes. Uh... Um, equitable financing issue in Malaysia, where uh, thirty five percent of total expenditure on health actually is come out of pocket OOP. That means uh, people actually pay with their own money. When you know most uh, public uh, healthcare services, you don't even need to pay much. That means uh, this uh, this whole portion of uh, OOP expenditure, 16, 76% actually coming from the private. And there's one statistic uh, told us that, uh, tell us that about 33% uh, of um, the population actually cannot afford private insurance. That's the main cause of uh, a lot of uh, OOP in Malaysia. So I would, won't say this is equitable because uh, when you have a serious uh, health issue such as uh, cancer, this can really cause you uh, catastrophic, financial catastrophe. Uh, people really have to sell house assets just to finance their, the medicines, the treatment to survive. And there are some they knew uh, they wouldn't want to cause this uh, situation to the family, they choose to die. This is the saddest thing for us in Malaysia because I think if we do believe in right to health, we believe in solidarity in the care of uh, every uh, unfortunate people, including the cancer patients, then we shouldn't have this system at all, have people left to die because they couldn't afford. So that's one a very big, uh, um, I would say, motto or slogan for People's Health Forum. We say health for people, not for profits. This The spirit is that we shouldn't, differentiate people by the ability to pay because we believe firmly believe in right to health. So I think if we can um, restructure the, the financing issue, probably we can take care of everyone. There's no need to choose whether you want to have life or money. Yeah. Uh, so so the, the financial, uh, the financing thing is the major uh, uh, contention because uh, before uh, the the dissolution of the parliament, the previous government already called for a um, health white paper. They asked uh, the civil society and patient groups and stakeholders to have the discussion and they drafting the health white paper. One major issue is that they look into the health financing. Just how I say they have the difficulty in getting more uh, financial resources from the finance minister, from the government. So every year they keep at about 2% of GDP. Although in the real term, you see the money actually getting more and more per year, but it's not sufficient to keep up with the demand and the population growth. Even the population growth, they couldn't keep up. With. So um, the, there are many different views about how to get more money. So some people actually will want to go for uh, social health insurance. So we changed the whole... Uh, uh, financing system to social health insurance. That means um, from the uh, People's Health Forum uh, point of view, we think that this is additional tax. If you say you want to have this social health insurance and asking everyone who are uh, in the formal sector uh, working, you want to take uh, some kind of a, like 10% or some kind of tax from the working people, I would say this additional expenditure uh, sum is a tax. Uh, where you previously do not have to do it. And once you have this social financing uh, system, that means you need to have more layers of uh, administrators. You have to enroll people, you have to check whether they, they are in the program. So all this actually making the system less uh, efficient. I, I want to say about uh, how the government control the pandemic is a very uh, good example why we need to keep the current uh, uh, government uh, general taxation system is that uh, government being the um, regulator, funder, payer and, uh, and service provider, when they make decision, especially when the pandemic comes, 
you need fast decision, you need a coordinated action. So for the first two waves of pandemic, um, government actually can keep it down within a um, specific time and it's, it was a success story. Only the third wave when, uh, before the Delta, uh, when Alpha came, then the, 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 the government come. But I think that was also the same case for many governments in the world at the time. But for the first two ways, actually government control it very well. One thing is that the, the, pub, the civil servant uh, in the health ministry, they are very well coordinated. They, they work together very closely and it was the public sector who handled the pandemic. So if we have some situation like the NHS, the current NHS in UK, they have to negotiate with uh, many service providers. When the, 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 the negotiation was not going well, then you have a lot of delays and uh, miscommunication uh, or lack of coordination. That explains some Western countries uh, fail to really contain even in the very beginning. I think Malaysia showed a very good example how we can do it because uh, the, 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 the command lines are uh, intact within our system. Uh, so, so we actually do not agree with the social health insurance uh, transition because I think it's just a political will that it's not the Malaysian government do not have the money to pay for the additional uh, demand for the public expenditure, just that they do not have the political will. Now, because after the pandemic, everyone asked for the increase and all the competing parties right now, they promise 5%. What does it show? That means when people actually, after the pandemic, people do see there's a real need and people appreciate and uh, start to prioritize health. Exactly. That's when the government and political parties and politicians change their stance and say, oh yes, we need to invest more. Everyone say so. I, I think this thing about, you know, going into social health insurance is also a bit tricky because it opens doors for privatization and somewhere, like you're saying, uh, it's an inefficient way of spending also because we are giving a lot of people's hard-earned money to the private sector. It actually takes its own profit and a lot of, like you are saying, administrative and managerial levels, excessive yep. levels. Okay. And instead, government can just build more hospitals, recruit more doctors and give the services. I think in India also, we are having a similar, you know, <laughs> argument all the time. That, <laughs> uh, but what happens is that when you argue against the health insurance model, it becomes like, oh, you are against welfare. Because, but this is a double-edged welfare where the welfare goes to the private sector at the cost of the public finances. Uh, Chihad, it's, uh, it has been wonderful talking to you. Would you, is there anything, you know, the elections are uh, come around the corner and you're saying also that the civil society is, uh, uh, you know, epic at its demand, I mean, putting its demands forward and so on. How do you see the immediate uh, demands and how is it that, you know, the groups in Malaysia are organizing themselves, not just on health, but also different welfare, you know, safeguarding these welfare measures. Uh, could you, you know, as a signing off, would you, if you could say, what is the way forward from here and what are you planning as a People's Health Forum in Malaysia? Uh, for People's Health Forum, we will keep on engaging with the government and also with, uh, we'll, we'll put up our narrative uh, in the media, in public, to convince the public that uh, the way forward is for the government to show political view uh, to try their best first to inject more money into the, uh, the badly needed uh, public sector. Um, so that's one way before you consider other, other uh, financing methods like uh, social health insurance. We do not reach that stage yet. But uh, after the pandemic, uh, like you say, is uh, people talk about um, the social determinants for health. It's not just about healthcare. We want to move away from the notion of uh, when we talk about healthcare, it's about sick care. Now people really want to prioritize about how to stay healthy, the wellness part, and uh, how that we can actually strengthen the primary care. Uh, that's uh, the, the focus of our, uh, the blueprint on healthcare, uh, health reform in Malaysia, uh, published by People's Health Forum. We do think that the, the fundamental is with the primary care. We, we, uh, we urge the government to set up a, a family doctor system 
where the um, every family members would have their own dedicated doctor so that the doctor would know the, the medical history of your family and know about your habits. Probably every year they could see you once. Uh, and this additional income for the private uh, GP as well, if they enroll in that system. It's not something uh, very far-fetched because Malaysia already have one such program called Perka B4B is to take care of the bottom uh, income, 40% of bottom income families uh, to do health screening for them. It's already there. Just government has to expand it beyond the 40 and go up to the medium, medium, uh, middle 40 and then a top 20. So to cover everyone, because I don't think um, rich families are immune from health problem. They probably also have a lot. Uh, so it's nothing about the income level. So that's what we call for the reform uh, to put more resources on health promotion and primary care, uh, health screening, and, uh, and uh, especially we have one uh, call for the government to put a moratorium on building new private hospital. We think that 202 is already way more than enough and we do not want them to expand the hospital beds. Yeah, so that's one call in our uh, um, uh, blueprint, people will say that's a bit uh, socialist, but I would say is they have actually the current capacity to, to use more because on the bed or, or beds or occupancy, they uh, roughly score about 50% 50, 50 or so, where the government hospital, most of the specialist, major specialist hospital already more than 80% of the bed occupancy, very, very uh, resource traps. So we hope that there's a more uh, kind of a collaboration between the private and public hospital, uh, government actually can uh, purchase, do spread a strategic purchase from the private sector at a cost price or uh, at a price that government can agree. Uh, this is a very tough thing to go into, but I think it's actually mutually beneficial if um, a government, the private hospital will purchase any very expensive equipment, they would actually want to have more usage. I, if a government, is uh do not have enough of such uh, uh equipments and there's a long queue for those why not you just do some kind of arrangement i think that's uh one thing we also call for strategic purchase but must be on government's term not on the private sector's term yeah um so basically this is it uh roughly about um what we think about how to take up take up the major problems in the, the uh, in Malaysia on health. Thanks a lot, Chihan. I think uh, the complexities and you know the way forward, uh, I'm sure that the People's Health uh, Forum in Malaysia is able to you know, increase its advocacy and activism and uh, we wish you all the best in, the, you know, in advocating for universal health care and uh, the issues of patients and people in general.